If that's not done, there's not enough electricity for the French experiments and maybe not even enough to provide life support for six people on Mir during the three-week transition period. Okay. The crew of Mike Fole and two cosmonauts now on Mir is slowly recovering from the almost disaster of Thursday. Mir has enough electricity to generate oxygen and remove carbon dioxide, and it's no longer uncomfortably hot on board. It'll be Monday before a decision is made on whether to allow Fole and the Russians to fix Mir or wait until August when fresh cosmonauts arrive. John Holloman, CNN Atlanta. At this point in the program, we could discuss Mir's problems from a technical or engineering standpoint, or we could look at exactly how the repairs will be conducted. But instead, we want to look at the men, not the machines involved in all of this, men on the ground, and in space. Joining us now is Dr. Harry Holloway, a former associate administrator with NASA, who's also a psychiatrist, and Pat Dash, editor of Ad Astra, the magazine of the National Space Society. Ms. Dash, let me begin with you. Who calls the shots at mission control when there is a joint uh, U.S.-Russian uh, crew up in the Mir space station? This is a, a Russian spacecraft. The Mir is the Rus Russia's pride and joy and the Russians are in control. We obviously are very concerned because we have an astronaut up there and so the American commanders are offering every assistance and as we understand it right now there will be some American tools going up, uh, uh, something that helps you connect cables with space suit gloves on, uh, some lights which are qualified to operate in the vacuum of space since they've had to turn all their lighting off. But we're there s essentially to support. We'll do anything to help that we can, but we're not running things. Dr. Holloway, is this frustrating for the Americans? I think that this is a part of uh, learning to uh, live and work in space in an international environment. I think that it's uh, a part of international missions that uh, there are varying command arrangements uh, and specialized demands put uh, that uh, people are learning about as they work through each of these problems. Really one of the purposes is to learn how to live and work in space and of course this looks forward to a space station that itself is multinational. What kind of problems, Dr. Holloway, are we looking at? Are, are we looking at cultural differences? Well, human beings show up with all their um, uh, strengths and, uh, and their weaknesses. Uh, they show up with their cultures. Uh, certainly cultural differences uh, influence the way in which we and the Russians communicate. Uh, we certainly bring our culture to the situation with uh, the sorts of uh, special lenses it brings to seeing things, as do the Russians. But there is also a, a sort of common culture of space uh, and of space missions. And much of that is a technological and engineering culture that has many commonalities. So I'm, there are a number of cultural issues involved here. And uh, we're fortunate, I think, to have people who are both prepared to uh, and expect to uh, manage those cultural issues appropriately. Ms. Dash, what do you think are the main differences that, that occur in there mission are, control? There are big cultural differences. I think we've trained here in the US uh, very much towards a teamwork scenario. Uh, we have s seen over the last few days the people in mission control in, in Russia have been tending to uh, tell their, their cosmonauts to shape up and get on with it and then telling them you must rest. Uh, so there are, are some very big cultural differences which, which I think cause a little bit of tension or rather than attention might not be the right word, it, it makes us stop and pause and think a little more about how to handle situations. So there isn't a, a very smooth communication flow where you have to watch each other's moves. Dr. Holloway, Pat Dash, stay with us. When we come back, we'll shift our discussion from the ground to the air. The psychology of space in just a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Mir is not much larger than a room or two in an average home. It is cluttered with wires, tubes, and electrical equipment vital for keeping its inhabitants alive. For the past several months, those inhabitants have had to deal with one mishap after another. Fires, collisions, power outages. But by now, they may just want to give up and come back home to Earth. What does months of tense time in space do to an astronaut or cosmonaut? Once again, we're joined by psychologist, uh, psychologist Dr. Harry Holloway and journalist Pat Dash. Dr. Holloway, let me begin with you. Can we even imagine and conceive what six months, let's say, in space for the Russian cosmonauts does to them? Uh, to some extent we can because, uh, after all, the Russians have been doing this for some time. We have a fair amount of experience and we've had some good communicators. But in using your introduction to this area, you talked about this being like the size of a room. But of course, this is a room in which there are no floors, no ceilings, uh, in some senses no sides because people are in free fall. It's a room uh, like no other room that you have ever been in, uh, in terms of orienting yourself. And this is all something that's a very natural, and sometimes, I must say, the uh, astronauts find this, this experience of being in continuous free fall being rather exhilarating. I think the thing that we must also note is that this puts special requirements on how they do things, learning to do things in a totally different way uh, than they might do them on Earth. And these are all, of course, skills that they've mastered. Uh, and speaking of skills, is there any screening for character, stamina well, that well, they do? Of course, there's a tremendous amount of screening that, that goes into uh, the various sorts of both physiological testing as well as psychological testing, and a fair amount of screening uh, in terms of uh, choice, and I'm speaking specifically here of astronauts, that has to do with their ability to work with their teammates and to develop the teams. I think that was emphasized before. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there is a fairly arduous process of on-ground training in uh, uh, swimming pools called uh, wet Fs or in uh, areas where they're in the diving mode so that they get something of the overall uh, um, feel of what it means to live in this uh, three-dimensional world in which there is no up and no down. So there are a number of things done that, that do that sort of selection. Ms. Dash, speaking of all the difficulties they need to overcome, and, and we add to this uh, the mishaps that this crew has had to deal with, have there, been, have there been other experiences in space close to what these three members of this crew have, have experienced? They're having a pretty bad time, but we, we have had situations which have definitely stressed crews uh, the Apollo 7 crews all got head colds and got very upset with things easily and that led to a lot of stress the third Skylab crew uh, and we're going talking back now in the 70s um, were asked to do maybe a little too much work to just keep the science data coming uh, over a long period of time and finally essentially mutinied and said hey guys we're taking a day off so uh, while we haven't seen uh, the sort of catastrophes we're seeing on Mir with the fire and the crash uh, we have seen crews pushed to the limit and you should remember that Norm Thagard who was the first US ast astronaut to spend a period of time aboard the Mir came back somewhat on unhappy because he felt he didn't have um, enough personal effects personal space and we learned a lot from that when Shannon went up she had her own library she had her area which has become like the US astronaut area in the Spectre module and sadly Mike Fole now has lost his his little corner to go off and be private and a lot of his personal effects Dr. Holloway is there a certain type of person that does better than others uh, in space? Well, I think that we haven't been in space. We're just at the beginning of our space age. And so I think that it would be uh, presumptuous to talk about a better sort. Uh, I think that what we're dealing with now, though, are these exploratory missions where people are doing really uh, many things for the first time or nearly the first time. And, and I think this does require a special sort and people of uh, both very high motivation, uh, who have uh, an exceptional set of talents, and uh, who have uh, various talents. So number one, yes, there are some characteristics 
that are probably exceptional and required, but there is also a fair amount of variety in what's required to get along in space. I also want to make one comment that uh, notes that, that Mir has had a power failure before this, approximately two years ago, at the time a European astronaut was on, on board, uh, so that the overall operation without power is not a new phenomenon, but something which has happened before. Dr. Hollow, what do you think of the way uh, the Russian mission control has handled this? Uh, there have been remarks, I'm dealing with a kindergarten here from the chief uh, mission control specialist. Uh, uh, are they being too impatient with those astronauts and uh, the astronaut and the cosmonauts up there? I, I think it would be inappropriate for me to offer any criticism uh, of people uh, operating under uh, stress both on the ground and in space, attempting to accomplish things uh, in terms of how their exchange is going. They're working through a number of very difficult problems, that there will be wisecracks, that there will be jokes, that there will be even an unfortunate remark, and a challenging remark it is not unexpected, nor is it new in the history of, of communication between crews and, and ground control. I think the question is how they work through these issues and how they're prepared uh, to bring discipline uh, to the overall communication process. Uh, actually, I, I think that one of the things we're again trying to learn about is how to master uh, exactly these kinds of communications in a transcultural setting with uh, crews made up of various groups. As was already noted, Norm Thigert had a number of complaints uh, that really related to the fact that, that he didn't have enough to do. Part of it personal, but also part of it just in terms of being integrated into the crew. One of the things we see on this mission is a, as a positive outcome is the degree to which the uh, American astronaut is integrated into the crew. And we've already begun to see that in, in Shannon's flight and in others, so that there's a real flow of work between the crew that is Russian and American together. So all of these things are, are achievements that you see coming out of this process. I like think one other thing that we ought to take some note of is that one effect of stress that is sometimes not, give, not taken note of is that it improves performance when it's operating in a moderate range, and particularly when it's operating in a moderate range for well-trained, uh, well-disciplined people. And I have a personal question to ask both of you first, Ms. Dash. Would you like to go up on Mir? Not right now. No, thank you. <laughs> what about you, Dr. Howard? <laughs> well, I'm afraid that my answer would be in a heartbeat, uh, because I, I think that this is really one of the most uh, exciting enterprises that we're involved in, and that our chance to learn how to repair, how to build, how to fix, is really one that's going to happen under difficult circumstances. And the opportunity to take part in that sort of uh, uh, of step towards exploring our universe, I think, is one which I couldn't resist. Thanks to both of you, psychiatrist Dr. Harry Holloway and Pat Dash, journalist Pat Dash with the National Space Society. We'll have to take a break right now, but when we come back, Mir's successor and the future of humans in space, a look at the International Space Station. Stay with us. Back with all the problems on Mir, some say the time has come to just give up on the Russian space station, but Russian mission control doesn't want to discuss that because Mir is a cash cow for the financially strapped Russian space program. It earned $471 million last year from the U.S. and other countries who put astronauts on board. Additionally, the struggles to keep the Mir station afloat are an important part of the learning process for everyone working on its replacement, which is the International Space Station. For a better understanding of the relationship between Mir and the International Space Station, once again, Again, we're joined by journalist Pat Dash. Ms. Dash, what is the significance of keeping Mir afloat with regards to the International Space Station? It's in the plan. There's an existing plan which says uh, that the U.S. will continue to send astronauts to Mir until we are fully embarked on construction of the International Space Station. Uh, and there are some, some budgetary things that go along with this. So if we change the plan, then Congress gets to look at the budget and we get back into a big discussion about where we're going. The other big worry is no one wants to insult the Russians or really upset the Russians. The Russians are a 
big part of the space program, a big part of the International Space Station, and we don't want them to be discouraged. You mentioned funding problems. Does this mean that this, uh, the International Space Station will be delayed further on? It's already been delayed by a year uh, because as far as I read, the Russians did not have the funds to build their segment of the International Space Station. What's happening now on Mir really shouldn't affect that. Uh, it took a long time to get the Russians to get the money flowing and there was a delay uh, but we're looking at starting with first launch of June next year and then things really start happening later in the year and that as far as we know is on schedule but uh, what you're hinting at I think is, is the fact that uh, Although the astronauts in Houston and many at NASA like to think of us as a partnership on Mir, we are essentially a paying customer on the Russian space station and they need that revenue. They need that revenue to keep their space program going and that means to keep the experts employed in space business rather than another business and if they start losing expertise or they have a breakdown in their space program then of course there could be a domino effect into their part of the International Space Station. Let me ask you, what is the significance of all the lessons that we have learned so far from Mir with regards, and all the mishaps with regards to possibly sending a man on Mars? That's a, a big leap. In fact, we've learned a great deal. Uh, the Russians have had space stations for a long time. This one's been up there for 11 years. We've learned a great deal about human physiology. Um, for example, Norm Thag had told me just uh, a couple of months ago that even though he's been back on the ground for quite a long time, uh, the, his bone structure is still a long way back from how it was before he flew. You lose a lot of bone mass in flight. You, you lose bone mineral. Um, and studying people from long flights is telling us a lot about what's going to be involved in sending humans to Mars. And we have a lot, lot more to learn. And we will be following this fascinating story. Pat Dash, thank you very much. Thank Pat you. Dash is a journalist with National Space Society. And this final note before we go. We have discussed how the men on Mir are motivated by pride, desire, and even fear. Well, the Russians on board are also motivated by money. The standard contract signed by a Russian cosmonaut states that his salary depends on the tasks he performs in space. How many experiments are successfully completed? How many times Mir orbits the Earth? How many spacewalks are taken? No one will say how the pay of the two cosmonauts currently on Mir will be affected by all the problems they have been forced to address. They may be in for a big bonus or a big fine when they finally come home. It's for us to see. And that is Inside for today. I'm Relisa Vasilova sitting in for Jonathan Mann. Thanks for joining us. The news continues in just a moment. was in part to in the vacuum of space since they've had to turn all their lighting off but where there's essentially to support we'll do anything to help that we can but we're not running things dr holloway is this frustrating for the americans i think that this is a part of uh, learning to uh, live and work in space in an international environment i think that it's uh, a part of international missions that uh, there are It'll be Monday before a decision is made on whether to allow Fole and the Russians to fix Mir or wait until August when fresh cosmonauts arrive. John Holloman, CNN Atlanta. At this point in the program, we could discuss Mir's problems from a technical or engineering standpoint, or we could look at exactly how the repairs will be conducted. But instead, we want to look at the men, not the machines involved in all of this, men on the ground and in space. Joining us now is Dr. Harry Holloway, a former associate administrator with NASA, who's also a psychiatrist, and Pat Dash, editor of Ad Astra, the magazine of the National Space Society. Ms. Dash, let me begin with you. Who calls the shots at mission control when there is a joint uh, U.S.-Russian uh, crew up in the Mir space station? This is a, a Russian spacecraft. The Mir is the Russia, Russia's pride and joy. And the Russians are in control. 
we obviously are very concerned because we have an astronaut up there and so the American commanders are offering every assistance and as we understand it right now there will be some American tools going up uh, uh, something that helps you connect cables with space suit gloves on uh, some lights which are qualified to operate If that's not done, there's not enough electricity for the French experiments and maybe not even enough to provide life support for six people on Mir during the three-week transition period. Okay. The crew of Mike Fole and two cosmonauts now on Mir is slowly recovering from the almost disaster of Thursday. Mir has enough electricity to generate oxygen and remove carbon dioxide and it's no longer uncomfortably hot on board.